Hello, everybody. My name is Eric. We all know reCAPTCHA. We all hate reCAPTCHA. It's terrible, and it's a much bigger impediment to disabled users than it is to bots these days. Well, it's also an increasingly popular vector for malware known as ClickFix. And today we're going to be taking a look at a very interesting sample that was distributed this way. Uh, it's interesting for a couple of reasons. It's interesting because of its obfuscation, and it's pretty interesting what it ends up doing. So, you've seen it before. Now this one is a bit different because it uses this command, msi exec, slash qn, which is quiet, and then slash i, which downloads, on cloudverify.com, which is... Uh, there have been a few variants of that wording, which implies to me that this is probably an extended campaign. And then we get a file called i.msi. Now, if you go to this in a browser, at least assuming... Okay, so they have finally taken the C2 uh, for this offline, but luckily I have all the files. Uh, what you'll end up getting, go back up to the top one, is this file.msi. Now, this is a Windows installer package, and it has some interesting stuff. I've We both... Myself and the person who sent this to me tried it extensively on a sandbox, and 99% of the time, what it would do, so it extracts these files, this batch file, to something in your app data called Crocal Civil Tools. And it will always do that, and it will extract a bunch of stuff. Most of that is just a complete red herring. There's a bunch of Python stuff in here that never gets executed. But what it will also do, and... It has anti-analysis. That's my best guess. I actually haven't totally cracked the MSI. So it's got some sort of anti-analysis that decides whether to give the real password, which ultimately continues the operation. Uh, the second argument in xupdate.bat, I'll just show you what xupdate.bat does. Edit this in notepad. We can see, all right. So we got our first argument and then our second argument. And the password and that's also passed to openvpn.exe. So my initial assumption when I first looked at this was that it would use OpenVPN to connect to some sort of C2 server. But that was all the red herring. We're going to take a quick break for our sponsor, and then I'll tell you what actually happens. Modern malware is increasingly lightweight, stealthy, and hard to detect. That is why this video is sponsored by ThreatLocker, a zero-trust solution that blocks threats by default. They use a simple idea. What if instead of trying to know every possible threat, you only allow software your organization uses? Deployment is an easy three-step procedure. Install ThreatLocker. It automatically starts in learning mode. ThreatLocker will monitor every program in your environment, automatically learning what you need. Then, you'll shift into protected mode, where any unrecognized software is blocked by default. Don't worry about updates. ThreatLocker automatically maintains a database so that software updates work seamlessly. Are you worried about living off the land attacks or vulnerable software you rely on? ThreatLocker has you covered with application-level ring fencing. You can lock apps down to specific folders or remove dangerous internet access from tools that don't need it. Does this sound interesting? Improve your company's security posture today at the link below. ThreatLocker.com slash Eric Parker. Now back to the video. And if you get the wrong password, you'll just be confused. And I actually thought that the sample was just straight up broken. But luckily, our submitter tried again. And on any run, for some reason, this turned out to be a golden run, that instead of getting a zero here, it got this code. This is the password. I also tried brute forcing uh, the archive. That didn't work, because it was obscenely... It's way too long. That would take centuries, and it's not a dictionary word. So, when that happens, that also gets passed to OpenVPN, but that's still a red herring. So what really happens here is... A malicious DLL gets injected into OpenVPN. And the main fallout of this is this PowerShell window. Now, this calls uh, an incredibly obfuscated PowerShell, ultimately downloads and executes another file. That other file is available here. We'll call it some fun. So the other file we get is called sysqui.bb. sysqui.bb is a 16 megabyte blob of base64. Now I actually have a Python unpacker of it here so you can get an idea of what's going on. So we remove some padding stuff. Then the third stage, which is that, because I'd already tried the first two stages we'd already explained. So we go in here 
got a bunch of base 64, except and we don't we don't want to replicate the final execution. So we get all of that, base 64, and then finally it's got some encryption. So when you've traced through double base 64, I don't really see a ton of point in double. Maybe it pulls automated tools. It's not gonna really you can tell when you're looking at base 64. So you find that you get something encrypted, and the way this works is at the bottom of that blob of base 64, there's a bunch, a bunch of code. And then it's XORed. That gives us stage four. We may actually have stage four. I'll just show you what it looks like. You got a bunch of codes and then a method of decoding it. So finally, after all of this, we get to the end of the puzzle function. So we got this, then we've got what is essentially, and this is still base 64, and this is a system that will ultimately dump out a malicious Chrome extension that is a part of the exfiltration routine. Once we get through that, we can see some pretty easy to understand and properly named, because I guess they weren't expecting analysts to get this deep, code. Now this is to do with the extension writer, kills the browser, then it puts our malicious extension into the browser. This is a technique I've seen before, because while Chrome has gotten very good at hardening the outside with their system level process, it's still possible with just user permissions to copy an extension in. You can got some UI automation here, then it generates a random name and it drops the extension in and it targets all of these. Now, you will actually be safe if you're on Firefox from this, because I guess they didn't want to bother making two separate uh, malicious extensions. The final phase of info stealing happens within the browser. I also did have an attempt at uh, getting the encrypted stub from this malicious DLL out, but I, I didn't succeed, so we're actually going to take a look at that dynamically in just a second. I'm going to actually run this in a VM. We got AS cipher. Yeah, and we can see a good chunk of it here. Now, I actually ran so that we could see what all of this would do. I actually ran an AnyRun instance with this. So it copied that into every browser, and now all of these browsers have a malicious extension. We can also read uh, the functionality of the malicious extension, although it is fairly obfuscated. And this is actually pretending to be a Google Drive extension, but in reality we can see this is something much sneakier. It has a bunch of permissions, and it's got a service worker. And here we can see the actual C2 domain, which has now been luckily uh, taken down. We can see all of these are getting injected, and that's uh, essentially the stealer technique, and it's pretty clever because it's an extension, so some antiviruses might miss that. So now let's take a closer look at how that DLL works. Okay, so we're back. Kind of batting 500 here. So I did a bunch of analysis on this, went through the static analysis. I'm not going to keep digging through this DLL because there isn't a lot of point. Uh, all of the interesting stuff doesn't live in here. Uh, it ultimately spawns the PowerShell routine I already showed you, and we can more easily observe this uh, dynamically. It does seem to use quite an interesting method that seems to kind of screw around with decompilation, where the jumps are being misinterpreted, but from uh, going over this, it does step through, it has a, a weird uh, decoy game, uh, let me show you, uh, and it's also smart enough to check the command line, so that if you run DLL or use x64's run DLL, it actually realizes that this is not openvpn.exe. This Tetris game is actually kind of good, and from doing, uh, I, I pointed a reverse engineering agent I've been working on at it, and it also found a chess game inside of this, which is just weird. I guess they also want to pad the binary so that static analysis is going to waste more of your time, but what I did want to show you is how the MSI mystery that I announced at the beginning of the video works, because I think this is actually kind of cool. So, the zero that we saw getting passed through, uh, the password, and this is where this domain comes into play. So the password we see here, zero. So this site right here will respond, depending on what is posted to it, 
with either a the correct password for the archive or something completely nonsensical. Now, I haven't 100% and it's functionally impossible to reverse engineer server-side code because we can't really, I, I could try fuzzing it, uh, but there, there could be a number of factors at play. I'd imagine IP address is probably one of them. Uh, it could also be a simple time of day or time of campaign. Like one way they could do it is only within five minutes of showing the actual fake capture, maybe then it would run. That I haven't totally figured out, but I was totally confused. The way I figured this out is I found this, this site right here, and this is a really good site. It's actually really useful. So you upload the MSI into here, and you can actually just step through everything. Because an MSI file is just a database, and it can include custom commands. It's kind of a weird and increasingly obsolete. I'm just going to show you an example because I don't have the sample in this system. Um, you can step through it, and you can go to... Uh, these and you can go if it has the custom commands that's a really important one and you can actually figure out what's going on so that's going to be all for me for now this was a pretty interesting setup overall we had a powershell stealer that drops a malicious chrome extension that's dropped by a server side anti-analysis that's that then drops a super obfuscated dll uh, and it's also interesting because rather than having a big dropper on the server, this server just responds with numbers. So it'd be harder to report this server for malware because there's technically no malware on this service. There's just a password for a malicious archive. That's going to be all for me for now. Bye.